Good morning. Welcome back to Mill Creek Church. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here. Glad you can make it to another one of our studies. This time we are beginning another new series. It just seems like the time keeps flying by and we're just studying so hard here and we're moving right along through these series. And I really had a, a wonderful time putting together the last series. It really challenged me as I was putting it together and uh, I never want to preach something that I, I don't first preach to myself and try to implement in my own life. So it was very challenging as I walked through that time and walked through the, the life of Joseph together with you and saw the resiliency there and tried to put that into practice in my own life. And uh, it, it was very challenging, but it was also very rewarding because at the completion of that series, we found out that we were able to look back and, and have that perfect 2020 vision and see how God is orchestrating all things together for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. Such a wonderful truth that we find in Romans, but it was echoed all the way back in Genesis chapter 50, the first book of the Bible. But as we move forward, I just want to, to share with you briefly that one of the hardest parts of this profession of pastoring or preaching and teaching is understanding what it is that God wants his people to know today, right now. But then having that knowledge in advance so that you can aptly prepare to bring that message in the future. So what you are hearing today has been studied upon a week or sometimes multiple weeks in advance. And so that's there's some great difficulty there in preparing what God would have you hear today, planning out these sermons and these series of sermons out. And it's not a responsibility that I bear lightly, and in fact, when, one day Travis said jokingly that, that being the pastor was a, an easy and a great profession, and it truly is. It, it's caused me to open my eyes wider and to broaden my horizons. I'm only 25 years old, but it truly has caused me to think about the world from a different perspective and, and look at the people that are before me as image bearers of God and, and to truly see their hearts. and. and it's allowed me to seek the will of God in my life, and I find myself week in and week out looking for what God has going on in the world around me and constantly being awake to the fact that at any moment, at any part of any day, He can reveal Himself to me in such a way that I need to capture, I need to understand it, and then I need to be able to reiterate or teach that to His people. Such a marvelous, marvelous gift, really. And Part of being a pastor is to try and to remain positive and engaging and upbeat and fun. Uh, if you think about it for a moment, the majority of people uh, here at Mill Creek Church that attend our in-house services are older individuals. We, we have a typically an older congregation. Many of these have been Christians for a number of years, and they have heard the Bible preached often. In fact, many of them are regular attendees. And have regularly heard Bible exposition for 10, 20, 30, 40, and even more years. So as a young pastor especially, how do I speak to that audience and engage them while also simultaneously presenting the, the nuances, the intricacies of the gospel message, which they have heard time and time again in a way that's engaging, fun, upbeat, and useful to them? And so I, I think I found a way, and so this morning I'm proud to introduce to you what I'm calling Christian Jeopardy with your host, that's myself, Pastor Jay Galloway. So thank you for coming along, even though you didn't know that you were going to be along for the journey. And this game is going to be played a little bit differently. At our in-house services, we're going to give the category out and then have the audience members select uh, a number value, and then that will determine the sermon that they're going to hear that day. Uh, one lucky contestant will get to pick that number value and also try to answer the clue that comes along with it. But in this series, with it being online, that's not going to be possible. You're not going to be able to have that interaction because, unfortunately, this is not a live event. This is, in fact, pre-recorded. But uh, with 
with this game it's just like regular Jeopardy so you will have to provide me with the question that elicits the correct response it's just the same as Jeopardy so if the category was presidents of the United States the clue would read something like this this 16th president of the United States is known for his abolitionist attitude and is quoted as also saying if I could save the Union without freeing any slave I would do it to which the correct response would be who is Abraham Lincoln but the clues in our game won't be nearly as difficult or complex or try to trick anybody up so here we go the category for our game the category with which we'll play in person if you're joining us there is this it also happens to be the title for our series things Christians do things Christians do shouldn't be too hard of a category especially for many of our older folks who have been Christians for a length of time this should be second nature to them and as we ponder these things we also come to the time where we get to reveal our new slogan for this series so under this slogan or under this series we have a slogan to keep ourselves on track and our slogan for this series is going to be this faith applied results in life altering action when you apply your faith it changes lives perhaps yours perhaps others that are around you so when we are talking about things Christians do we're talking about making application of our faith in the world in a way that it results in life altering action whether in our own lives or in the lives of those we are encouraging and encountering and that very well may be your slogan for the rest of your life uh, I know it's a great Christian slogan uh, but you know we need to not get caught up on mantras and things like that but it's going to help us guide along the way so now is when we would have a contestant select the first amount and we would uh, read the clue and so on and so forth but because we can't do that here is the clue that I'm going to give you this morning and we'll just work our way down the list so this will be five hundred dollars if you can answer this correctly don't take it to the bank because I don't have five hundred dollars to give you this activity of the Christian consists of intaking information from the biblical text through a process known as this in English it occurs left to right but in some of the original texts it would be done right to left so the first message in our series called things to do is entitled read the correct response to that clue is what is read or what is reading the the taking in of correct information and to study this we're going to be turning to our passage today which is first Timothy chapter number four and we're going to be reading beginning at verse number six down through verse number 13 first Timothy chapter four verses six through 13 would you read with me if you put these things before the brothers you will be good servants of Christ Jesus being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths rather train yourself for godliness for while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. May we pray. Lord and Heavenly Father, as we discuss the things that Christians do, we come to this first message and we find out that we are to be reading your word, that we are to not only read it, but then set it before others and to teach and exhort to bring the text to life and exposit its meaning to expose the veracity and the truths thereof. And we just ask that you would do that now in our midst this morning, that you would take this word, make it more than just words on a page, but make application in our lives, take our faith and apply it so that we can truly experience life altering and life changing action. Here at Mill Creek Church, may we be a light to our community as we leave this place today. In Christ Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen and amen. 
the purpose of this series, the key reason that we're going to be studying the things Christian do is to move you as a Christian from a place of contentment or of complacency in what you have come to understand as, quote, Christianity, and to get you to develop a deeper understanding of what it means to walk with God each day. If this was a college course I was teaching, it would be called Faith Applied 101, taking our faith like I prayed, from words on a page to action in our lives and see something come of it. And the first topic that we'll uncover in this series is the very thing that we endeavor to do each and every Sunday morning together and each and every Wednesday night during our Wednesday night Word of Encouragement. We begin with the reading of the Word of God and then we move on to its exposition or the revelation of its meaning. Exposition means to expose the meaning of the text. Now, this morning our aim is going to be answer five of the most common questions about reading in, as a Christian. When Christians ask about reading, these are the five questions that get asked most often. But before we begin with that, I want to take a brief moment to walk you through our passage to give you an understanding for what it is that we're talking about. Paul here, writing to his son in the faith, Timothy, tells him that during the last days there are going to be, there's going to be a departure from the Word of God and a turning aside to what he calls in verse number one, deceitful spirits and teaching of demons. And he tells Timothy that to know the difference between holy and vain teaching, you must test it through two avenues, the Word of God and prayer, he tells us in verse number five. And then we pick up in verse number six, our reading today. And Paul says, upon laying out the various teachings or doctrines before the brothers, before believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, you, Timothy, are to, and remember, Timothy's a young pastor, are to stand before them as a pastor, as a teacher, and weigh the teachings against one another through the Word of God and through prayer with the people, with the brothers in Christ. And once you do that, you will see which one is vain, and then you are to have nothing to do with those silly myths, those false teachings. Rather, instead of wasting your time, the text admonishes the Christian instead to train themselves for godliness and to be examples in things like their conduct, in their love, in their faith, and in their purity, we read in verses 8 through 12. Well, that's all fine, well, and dandy, but how will I know? How will I know how to act in my conduct or in my love or in my faith or in my purity? And that's where we pick up today in our study. Verse number 13, devote yourselves to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation of that reading and to teaching of it. To know how to act, you must first be taught. And what you are taught must be correct, for if you're taught incorrectly, the only way that you can act is incorrectly. Hopefully that makes sense. Everybody's tracking with me so, for, so far. So let's begin by discussing our first action that the Christian is to do. Things Christian do, Christians do, the first thing is read. And we're going to ask our five questions, ask five questions. The first being this, what if I don't like to read? What if I don't like to read? Now, this might seem like a silly question, but it is actually a very important question. If a person is disinterested in books or in studies, then it's likely that the Bible on their table will never take root and become the Bible in their heart. They'll never intake it, and as such, they'll never act on it. So how do we answer the Christian who is genuinely asking this question, who doesn't like to read and therefore seems daunted by the biblical or by reading the biblical text. And I think a sound scriptural footing for answering this question comes from Hebrews chapter 12, I mean Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 12, a verse I'm sure many of you are familiar with, and if you're not, it is a great verse to begin with. It says, For the word of God is living and active. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of of the heart. For the person who asked this first question, what if I don't like to read? It is evident that they do not know the power that is found in the Word of God. And because of this, they do not know the impact that it can have in their lives and the testimonies that their lives can then have on the people around them, either for the good or for the bad. And to study this passage, I just want to go through four key words in this particular text. 
If your excuse for your lack of reading the biblical text comes from your disdain for reading in general, and you allow this to influence how often, how much, and how deeply you read, you will never, quote me here, you will never have a faith that the Bible says is a living, a living faith. That is a faith that is present in the world. We do not serve a God that is dead, but one that is is living. Our reading will be demonstrated through a transformation of our lives because upon our reading we can see the error in our ways and be corrected. We will then have a faith that is a living faith. We will have a faith that is an active faith, a faith that is applied in this world. Active means applied in this world. And this word in the Greek here comes from the root word for energy. Our actions should be productive or should be the productive due result of our reading. That is to say, the words on the page should not only influence our personal lives, but our outward actions in the world that, in which we live, or in the world in which we find ourselves. If you do not like to read, or if you find yourself saying, I don't want to read, you'll never have a faith that's living, you'll never have a faith that's active, thirdly, you'll never have a faith, faith that's piercing. A piercing faith is a faith that is powerful in the world. It literally means piercing. This word here in the uh, Greek text means to reach through an object. Our reading is to reach through our hearts, it's to reach through our minds, and it is to reform our lives. It's going to be demonstrated in our actions, and it's going to penetrate to the deepest, darkest, most innermost part of our lives and of our hearts. You want to know why churches are sometimes growing in numbers and yet we're not seeing a change in the world? The statistics keep showing that the church is being more like the world instead of the world being more like the church because we are not allowing the text to pierce to the soul and to the spirit, to the bone and to the marrow. We have forgotten the power that is in the word of God, the almighty word of the risen God. You'll never have a faith that's active. You'll never have a faith that's living. You'll never have a faith that's piercing. And you'll never have a faith that is discerning if you're not reading. A discerning faith is a faith that makes sense of the world. The word here means to critically judge. And critically here does not mean harshness. It means depth of judgment. You are to judge deeply. You are not to judge harshly. By reading, we garner a spiritual discernment by which we can test the waters. We can judge for ourselves through the Word of God and through prayer. Remember, that's the lens that we're to look through. And we can discern the thoughts and intentions of our hearts, but also the hearts of those around us. So, what if I don't like to read? Well, if I don't learn as a Christian to love reading the Word of God, it will be a detriment to my faith. I will be a Christian who is alive, but not capable of living. I'll be a Christian called to action, but incapable of performing it. I'll be a Christian who is lacking the powerful, piercing effect of the Word of God on my life and in the lives of others. And I'll be a Christian who is incapable of discernment and thereby leaving myself open to dishonest thoughts and intentions of my own heart. And that's quite a bit of information under that first question, but it is very crucial that you understand it all. And if you need to go back and play it, feel free to do so. Now on to the next question, question number two. Why does the Christian read? Why does the Christian read? Earlier we said that in order to know how to act, you must be taught. But here's the thing. If you're taught by fallible man, you might be wrong. If you're taught by a person, you might be wrong. However, if you're taught by God, and God is perfect, He knows all, He has all power, He cannot be wrong. Listen to Paul on the authority of God's Word. Our passage here, 2 Timothy chapter number 3, verses 16 and 17. Again, a very popular verse, or verses. All Scripture is breathed out by God, theanoustos and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So what? That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Why does the Christian read? Simple. When we read, we see what God has to say about the issues at hand. The text tells us two very important truths about why the Christian reads. The first is that Scripture is the, the truth, it is God-breathed truth. It is the authoritative word of the Almighty One. 
If you had to choose sides, hypothetically speaking, do you think it would be wiser to side with the God who created the universe and who sustains it day by day, or with one of his creations, man, who has been known to lie, to deceive, to cheat, to steal, to falsely accuse and proclaim, and even at times to maliciously seek to do harm to others? Do you side with God or do you side with man? But the Christian not only reads because if we don't, we won't know what God has to say about the issues, but also because it is profitable to us. There is great profit in reading the Word of God. We profit from reading and knowing the Word. We gain the resources that we need from the Word of God, from its pages, to do things like teach, to reprove, to correct, and to train ourselves and the church around us. We gain the resources we need to be complete, the text says, and equipped for every good work. So why does the Christian read? It moves us toward completion. It moves us from a place of ignorance or downright incoherence to a place of knowledge, wisdom, and discernment. We want to know the truth because the truth is what sets us free, or to say it better, the truth is who sets us free. The truth is Jesus Christ, and he is the only one capable of setting us free. So on to our third question this morning. The next one that guides our study is this. What does the Christian read? We know what to do if we don't like reading. We know what our faith will look like if that's the case. We know why we are to read. Now, what are we to read? A very, very important question. There is so much literature out there today that can take up precious and valuable time. So what information do we need to be intaking into our lives as Christians? And it should be obvious that the Christian wants to know more about God, right? At least I hope it's obvious. If that's why we read, to see what he has to say, then where do we find what God has to say? And Psalm 119 has this to say in verses 10 and 11. With my whole heart I seek you, the you there being God. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Now, folks, there is nothing wrong with reading Christian books or Christian periodicals or even regular books or periodicals. There's nothing wrong with reading in general. There's nothing wrong with reading study guides, with reading devotionals, with reading textbooks. And certainly there is nothing wrong with reading your pastor's Wednesday night word of encouragement, which comes out every uh, Wednesday at 7 o'clock on our Facebook page. Just a shameless plug there. But there is no greater place to spend your time than reading the word of God itself in the Bible. Do you know that if you only spent 15 minutes a day in God's Word, that that would equate to 91 and a quarter hours in a single year? Now, if you think about it like this, that there are 40 hours in a typical work week, that would be like taking over two weeks vacation where all you did during the day was read the Bible. Over two weeks in a row where all you did all day long was read the Bible, it adds up. That's just 15 minutes a day. And here's the important truth that Psalms 19, or Psalm 119 teaches us. Whatever we store up in our hearts determines what it is that we are seeking. Run it by you one more time. Whatever we store in our hearts determines what it is that we are seeking. And hopefully that makes sense. If you want to see what the weather is going to be like, you check the weather channel or the news. If you want to know what's coming on TV, you check the TV guide. Therefore, if you want to know what God has to say, you check where he has revealed himself. And the Bible says that God has revealed himself previously in a variety of ways by a myriad of means, but now he has most completely revealed himself in the person of Jesus, the word of God made flesh. And how do we know where that is? The word of God. It is in the Bible itself. How do we learn about Jesus? We read his word. But now this is important. I get this question probably more often than I get any other question, most, most asked I've ever received. Uh, which Bible do I read? Which Bible do I read? Perhaps one of the most answer, or asked questions I ever get, and I always respond the same way. How serious are you about your reading? How serious are you about reading the Word of God? For the serious scholar, for the person who takes it seriously, Learning the original language, the Hebrew, the Greek, and the Aramaic, is by far the best way to read the Bible. 
But for most people, this is a huge undertaking that more often than not, they just simply don't have the time for. So the next best thing is a, a uh, for us it would be English, but a, a Bible in your native tongue that keeps as close to the original text as possible. Right now, the two that I recommend the most to people are the English Standard Version and the New American Standard Version. They are as close to a word-for-word -word translation as you can get, while also taking into account the uh, newest, which are actually the oldest scrolls that we have found from uh, over there in, in the tombs and in the, uh, in the rocks over in the Holy Land. And there are some other things we can read, other resources, commentaries, concordances, things like that, so on and so forth. You can read all of these things, but by far, what does the Christian read or what should the Christian be reading? It should be the Bible. Our second to last question focuses on this. How should the Christian read? How should the Christian read? You know there are thousands of Bible reading plans out there, some for a year, some that you can read four times in a year, some that are topical, others that are chronological. So how is it that the Christian should be reading? And I love what the prophet Isaiah says about this in Isaiah 28, 13, as he talks about the Word of God, as he talks about knowledge garnered from God's truth. He says, And the word of the Lord will be to them precept upon precept precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. First of all, we see in this passage repetition. Anytime we see repetition in the Old Testament, it should be really be a signal to our brains that something is really, really important that the author wants us to grasp. So what is it that God is saying here as he's talking or speaking through the person of Isaiah? And I think there are a couple of things that we need to understand here. The first is that the biblical text was written in a specific context and should be interpreted based on that context. Not all the books of the Bible were written at the same time under the same circumstances. It says line upon line, here a little and there a little. They were written over time, little by little, compiled together. To take that writing or to take those writings outside of that context or the context in which it was written is to be dishonest and it leaves us wide open to misinterpretations and misunderstandings. For instance, if we interpret the poetic literature as literally as we would the narrative literature, then Solomon's fairest love that he speaks about in the Song of Solomon would be absolutely hideous. And likewise, if we used our understanding of the Psalter or of the apocalyptic literature as the guide for interpreting the narratives, we would come up with the unthinkable and unimaginable taking place in our stories. Now, furthermore, the second thing this passage reminds us of is that we are to use the clear parts of Scripture, the clear parts of text, to help us interpret the parts that aren't so clear or aren't so self-evident. The text is built precept upon precept, Isaiah says, and then he repeats himself precept upon precept. In other words, you wouldn't dive straight into the deep end of the pool if you couldn't swim. It makes no sense, and the Bible really is no different. A good place to start reading the Bible is a book like Genesis or like Mark. Those are two that I typically recommend. Genesis, because it introduces you to uh, major characters in the biblical narrative. It takes you through a long series of history. It takes you through a, a broad uh, sense of time, and it introduces you to a lot of important individuals and themes that will continue throughout the Bible, as we saw in our previous series in Genesis when we talked about the story of Joseph and introduced the theme of resiliency, one that we see throughout the text. I recommend the book of Mark because it's a succinct picture of the life of Jesus of Nazareth. Only 16 chapters. It's very easy to get to or get through if you only read one chapter a day in just half a month. Now, some people will say that the book of John is a great place to begin with. Um, I don't recommend it because I could drown in it. But I guess if you're reading at a surface level as a, as a brand new believer, it would be a phenomenal book filled with irony and fresh insight into the gospel. But it's also very thick and rich theologically. I wouldn't recommend it. I wouldn't recommend a book like Hebrews. It's a difficult book, probably not one I'd recommend for believers and so on and so forth. These are just some of my recommendations. So how should the Christian read? First of all, read the Bible in its context. 
Read the Bible in the context in which it was written, book by book, chapter by chapter. Remember what's going on here making sure to pay attention to both the historical and grammatical nuances of the, uh, the text. But also, secondly, to allow the clear teaching of Scripture to help you understand those meatier parts that might take a little bit more tremendous study, uh, wisdom, and discernment from above. Don't jump straight to the deep end, so to speak. It's hard to believe we're already at our last question. Well, it's hard for me to believe that. You've probably been bored out of your minds at this point. Perhaps you've even skipped forward in the video. Perhaps you've turned it off altogether. But I find that time is just escaping me because of this. But our final question that we're going to be thinking through this morning is, what about after I read? Then what? This is where rubber meets the road. This is the application. What about after I read? Then what? And this is a very mature question. It understands that Taking in the text isn't the last stop in our journey as a Christian. And for this answer, we turn to Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. It says this, Blessed is the man who walks, not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. The psalmist says that there is a special blessing in store for the person who walks in the ways of the Lord and who delights in the law of the Lord or in the text of the Lord in God's word. And Paul talks ad nauseum about the Christian's walk and how we are to walk in Christ. And so I would refer to you or I would refer you to his writings in the New Testament because he does a far better job explaining that than I ever could. I mean, he's the apostle Paul. But I want us to pay very special attention to the last part of verse number 2 in Psalm 1 because I think it gets overlooked more often than not. The text says that on his law, that means on the word of God, we are to meditate day and night. On his law, that means the word of God. In the Old Testament, his law was what was written at that time. For us, it would be the closed canon of scripture, the full word of God. And it says, on his law, the one who is blessed will meditate on it day and night. So after we read, we aren't simply to forget what we've read. We're not to close this book and not think about it again until the next day or the next time we read. We are instructed instead to meditate upon it. Now this word here for meditate is interesting. It comes from a root word which means to murmur. And I'll explain that to you. When you're doing something that requires a, lot of, requires a lot of focus, a lot of attention, do you find yourself talking to yourself, either out loud or in your head? I know I do it all the time. I talk to myself in my head all the time, especially when I'm focusing the most. And occasionally I'll find myself speaking out loud. Um, I was working on um, my motorcycle when I got some new pipes for it, and I found myself not saying really nice things, you know, but I was I began to talk out loud. And this is the idea that the word in the Hebrew is trying to convey. It is attentively focusing so hard on the object at hand that everything else is simply background noise. That is what this word for meditate means here, to, in, to so adamantly be involved in what you're doing and what you're reading and what you're thinking about that even if you begin to talk to yourself, it goes unnoticed or it goes unchecked. Now, if you apply that to this passage, on God's word, the one who is blessed is not only to read, but after reading, to meditate upon it. There are layers and layers to the word of God. It's been said that this same word of God is both so simplistic that a child can wade into salvation through it, but also so complex that giants may drown in its depths. So I encourage you, as you meditate on the Word of God, there's no reason to sit crisscross and go, oh, that's not what I'm talking about here. Instead, take what we have discussed today and think on these things. How can I implement them in my life? Where can I make time for the God of the universe who created time and ordained it for me to commune with Him more closely? And just to ask, are you taking the time during the week to get into his word? Are you taking the time each day to read what God has to say to you that day? And folks, I have to be honest with you. It is the, the duty that I am bound by because of the calling that God has placed upon my life. We cannot, 
We will not grow as a church if we are not reading. We will not grow both in numbers, but more importantly, in depth of our faith. We will not grow if we as a church, not just Mill Creek, as we have a church universal, are not reading the Word of God. We will never deepen our faith if we are not reading. And so, as we end our first message in our new series called Things Christians Do, I hope that you like this kind of whimsical and fun format. It'll be way funnier in person than it will be just me speaking to the camera. But also, it is we need to understand the seriousness of this series and what it is that we're talking about. We're seeking to go deeper, to apply our faith, and to come out on the other side better equipped to handle the world before us that we understand is our mission field. And this week, we're going to read and we are going to meditate on God's Word. We're going to find a reading plan that works for us and allow God's Word to pierce our hearts and our souls, to go through and reach through our hearts, reach through our souls, reach into our minds, and change and shape the way that we think about God's Word and the way we read God's Word. And as we leave this week, don't forget our slogan for the next a few weeks here, probably six weeks or so, faith applied results in life-altering action. We're not just talking about church anymore. We're actually living it. And so as we leave this morning and as we close today, my encouragement to you this week is this. If you want to live a life in Christ that is living instead of just alive, that is active instead of just present, that is piercing and powerful instead of weak, and withdrawn and is discerning instead of nonsensical, I would ask that you recommit yourself to Jesus Christ today. Or if you have never come to know him, do so before it is everlastingly too late. And if you're serious about this, I would ask that as we close our eyes and bow our heads together in prayer, that you would seriously think about recommitting yourself to God, especially when it comes to the reading of his word. And as we Uh, begin this series and begin to move through this series, feel free to share these sermons with your friends and with your family if you haven't already. I would also go ahead and encourage you to head on over to the YouTube channel. If you're already here, click that subscribe button, turn on the little bell notification so that anytime a video goes up, you get notified. We don't have to send it out. You don't have to keep going to Facebook. Just subscribe, hit those bell notifications, and also leave a like on the video if you enjoy it. Uh, So you, you never miss out. But as we continue to move forward and think about the things that Christians do, we want to close in prayer as we think about reading the Word of God. May we pray. Lord Jesus, again, we come to you and we just humbly say thank you for all you've done and for allowing us each and every time that we've assembled ourselves together, whether it's online, via this platform that we have here, or whether it's in person there on uh, George 2 Highway. We are just so thankful that you have allowed us to open your word and that you just come forth from the midst and just intervene in our lives and help us to meditate on this word, to think about reading, to be more perceptive to how much we read and how often we read and how deeply we read, and help us to do it more and do it more thoroughly so that we may know you more and know you more thoroughly. Help us do this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Thank you for joining us. I apologize that it's been a little bit longer than some of the other ones have, but I really think that all of that needed to be said. If you need to digest it again, go back and watch those parts of the videos. It's one of the great things about having it online, and we just want to thank you for coming by and staying tuned with us until the end. And until next time and until next week, I'll see you then. Thank you.